Hello, everybody. This episode of the Sam and Trout Steel Letter Podcast is brought to you by AmatoBooks.com. A M A T O Books.com. Some of the finest fishing, cookbook, hunting, and all sorts of different books. And of course, our magazine, Sam and Trout Steel Header, Great Lakes Angler, and Fly Fishing and Tying Journal. You can get them all there at AmatoBooks.com. Well, thanks again for tuning in. And if you would not mind, please make sure that you have subscribed on whatever format you're choosing to listen on. And also, we love to see your comments. So if you could leave comments below on anything that you would like to mention or any questions you might have or any future topics for the Sam and Trusty Letter podcast, please leave those comments below. The article that I'm going to be reading is an article that I wrote. My name is Lucas Holmgren, and this article is called Don't Write It Off Just Yet. This article is featured in the magazine Sam and Trout Steelheader. Go ahead and pick up a copy at your local newsstand or subscribe. We've got a number of subscription deals on SamandTroutSteelheader.com. And we would love to have you be a part of our story here. So, this article... Don't Write It Off Just Yet by Lucas Holmgren. As anglers, we're all superstitious to an extent. And maybe superstition isn't the right word for it. Maybe it's a constant tinkering desire to dial in the perfect fish-catching scenario. Maybe it's a deep fear of ruining our chances due to one bad apple in our setup. This kind of attention to detail is key in developing yourself as an angler. It can help you to recognize patterns and avoid pitfalls to catch more fish. This desire to get it just right in order to catch the maximum number of fish must be guarded against the wrong assumptions. Whether or not we say, I'm just here for the experience or I just want to get out on the river, let's be honest, every angler wants to catch a fish or two. Ideally, we'd like to have opportunities to catch fish and there is something satisfying about finishing up a day of fishing with success. It is a tough pill to swallow when you work really hard, do lots of preparation, and go home without a bite. So what do we blame when that happens? Jumping to conclusions. I've heard it so many times before. Oh, I fished those shrimp all day and didn't get a single bite. Or we sat in the slot the entire tide and got zero action. Or those jigs don't work here. Our success measurement is determined by a pretty simple result. Did we get bit, and what happened after that? When no bite occurs, the first response is to wonder why, and this is the right response for an angler. But it is unwise to quickly blame one factor without considering them all. Now, on a year of incredible fishing, you will get people swearing by certain baits and techniques. And yet, if it had been a bad year of fish numbers, those same people may be cursing those same techniques. So was it your bait? Was there any fish there? Were they in a biting mood? I'm going to give an example of a time that I jumped to a wrong conclusion. I had a specific color of pink worm that was not actually pink in any way, shape, or form. I had tried it on two trips and lost confidence in it. Mind you, I didn't get a fish on any other color of worm. And I only got one steelhead in both of the trips, and that steelhead came on a spoon. Despite this, I put that color away and never tried it again. Two years later, I'm riding in a drift boat with a guide by the name of Keith Johnson, and he spills the beans about an ultra-effective worm, one that he's been hammering steelhead on, summer and winter steelhead. This worm was the exact one that I had written off and lost confidence in. Now, my mistake was losing confidence in a lure that hadn't even been given a proper shot. For this reason, I recommend when you're trying a new bait, Run that bait through the hole first, and then follow it up with a proven killer. Years ago, a friend by the name of Lonnie Brooks was trying out a brand of spinners that is actually no longer in production. Now, he was fishing them religiously, and he wasn't getting bit, but he was also running jigs and worms and catching a fair amount of fish. He wondered, is it just the spinner bite, or is it this spinner in general? So, he followed up that spinner with another spinner that he had caught multiple fish on. And in the very first hole that he did that, he got a fish. Now, would the spinners that he was trying out ever work? Perhaps, but he'd given them enough of a shot in the exact same circumstances up against a proven spinner to decide to stick with what he already knew worked. So let's talk about bite factors. Number one, is there fish present? 
This is the absolute, beyond all shadow of a doubt, most important factor of all. I myself would call this a 100% factor. If every other thing in your situation is absolutely perfect, it doesn't mean a thing if there is no fish where you are fishing. You must choose the time and place correctly where fish are present if you are to have any success, really. Some of the finest, most consistent anglers I know of are ultra-specific about choosing when and where they fish. You cannot rely on expert presentation alone. Knowing migration patterns, seasonal timing, and population levels all come into effect here. This factor is largely influenced by taking in information and using it to choose when and where to fish. You may choose to fish a spot the night before and then change your decision the morning of the trip due to a change in conditions. These decisions are absolutely crucial. Factor two, fish behavior. Factor number two, fish behavior. Fish respond to their environment in a big way. The study of fish behavior is a never ending interesting concept that anglers have been obsessed with forever. We learn more and more daily from science, angler documentation, and anecdotal evidence. Some major factors play upon fish behavior, including, but not limited to, water and air temperature, water clarity, light penetration, tidal influence, predator and bait presence, wind, current flow and water movement, time of day, moon phase, barometric pressure changes, seasonality, spawn and life cycle, competition for food, the list goes on. When you take into account any of these factors, one of them alone could throw away your chances at a fish. In some fisheries, certain factors don't have as much bearing, but in many, they must be taken into account and reacted to. If you've considered fish presence and fish behavior, you still haven't completed the picture. Factor number three, targeting the fish. Now fish don't wake up hoping to find your bait. They operate on their own time frames and with their own goals in mind. Some bites are triggered out of aggression, some as a feeding response, others from curiosity and opportunity. Those bites will only come if the bait or lure can be noticed by the fish in the first place. To be noticed, baits and lures are detected by sight, sound, vibration, smell. Some fish may be driven by all of these factors. Some fish tend to be highly visual feeders. I would suggest that largemouth bass and steelhead are driven by visual cues. They don't like a dead bait just sitting on the bottom and prefer certain movements, profiles, and colors. When it comes down to it, this factor is simply, did the fish notice your bait? Did it smell it? Did it see it? Did it hear it? Did it feel it? The fish must notice your bait. Now, once a fish has noticed your bait, you need to consider, is it in the range where the fish feels like making a move on the bait? And now is when the bait actually matters. Now is when the presentation matters. Now is when your angling skills, so to speak, will be a factor. When the fish has a solid choice on whether to bite your bait or not, now you should actually start considering, is it my bait? Is it the way I'm presenting it? Should I try something else? The right bait at the right time in front of the right fish will produce. So, have you lined up all of the factors? Before you claim that a certain bait, leader, weight size, float, rattle, wobble, or spin doesn't work, consider if they were even given a fair shake in the process. Perhaps you got one bite all day. You ran a specific plug for two hours while sitting on anchor in one slot. You decided to change the plug after the second hour, and then three more hours later, you got bit by a beautiful steelhead and brought it into the boat. Pleased as punch with your plug. So. Was it the plug? Or was it simply that by the fifth hour, the right fish in the right mood swam up and saw your presentation? It's hard to know. But here is one thing you do know. It worked. Fish don't lie, and that is a great sign. However, before you claim that the previous plug didn't work, it may be wise to test it again in another situation. We can start drawing conclusions after weighing multiple factors and the best way to do this is with a good network of anglers. If you are out trolling baits with 40 other boats and everyone is only fishing herring, resulting in 15 fish, is it safe to say that anchovies or spinners would not have worked that day? If there was an equal spread of herring, anchovies, and spinners, and 13 of those fish came on herring with only two on the other baits, 
Now we can start making some claims about the bite that day. Ultimately, you want to go with confidence. Ultimately, you want to go with what you're confident in. Very few of us, in fact, perhaps none of us, have the fishing time to weigh every single factor and experiment with every single bait. That is why learning from others about what baits worked in which situations can catapult us past the experimentation phase into some reliable lures that work. By sharing and learning from each other, anglers can put together pieces of the puzzle that help all of us to catch more fish. There will always be outliers and new options to consider, but over time trends will emerge and start to prove themselves. If you buy a fresh new lure and don't catch a fish on it in the first trip, you better be very sure before you write it off. Thanks for listening to this episode of Salmon Trout Steelheader podcast. And if you could, please go ahead and subscribe, leave comments, and let us know what you'd like to hear. If you have any questions, or if you just want to tell us that you liked it, or perhaps you didn't, we love to hear from you one way or another. Go to SalmonTroutSteelheader.com. You can read this article and many others from the comfort of your computer or smartphone, And we appreciate each and every one of you for listening.